podcast. We got Laura Lindsay talking about strength training for female athletes and a host of other good stuff. Tune in, grab a couple beers. Gonna be a real good time. The Strength House Podcast. Featuring Greg Robbins and Tony Bonvecchio. All right, everyone, welcome to the Strength House Podcast. This is episode number 11. You may notice that we have switched studios. We have a full house tonight, and uh, our small upstairs office can no longer fit the massive girth of all four of us (laughs) in there, plus a TV. So we've relocated to the kitchen um, alongside Tony as usual. We also have guest host tonight, Nancy Newell, yeah. Irish Josh here as always. And we have special guest tonight, Lori Lindsay, who you guys can see up on the television. Uh, just let us know if you can't hear her, but got her as loud and clear as possible. How's everyone doing tonight? Doing great. Excited for uh, you know a new landscape, a, a you know new lighting, just all in all new environment. I think it's gonna be good. Awesome. Yeah. So am I. Lori, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. Thanks for yeah. Fun. Excited to have you. Um, big night as you are finally our first female strength coach or female fitness professional, aside from Nance who made a guest appearance right. here and there, here and there, here and there. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we have some awesome topics to cover tonight, some different material from, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've covered so far, which is going to be a nice breath of fresh air and some, like, some really important topics, I think. Um, but before we get any further, the most important part of the show is the beer. So... Yeah, Lori's drinking already. Yeah! (laughs) Lori, what are you drinking tonight? Okay, we'll have a few different ones. I tried to get, I'm originally from Indiana, and I tried to get an Indiana beer, but that didn't go so well here in D.C. So I have this, can you see it? Summer Smooth Sail. Ooh, it's a nice looking can. Pretend that I know anything about beer. But, <laughs> um, and then this D.C. bra. Can you guys see that one? Bra. The Corruption. Ooh. The corruption. Yeah, it's like pretty it. good, yeah. Cool. So that's what I got. I'll let you guys know how they go. My brother recently, so my family's from Indiana as well. So, um, oh, yeah? Whereabouts? Um, like Crown Point and Munster, Indiana area. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. So my, there's a really great brewery there called Three Floyds yeah. Brewery. Um, my brother just went there, and we almost, he was, if the Celtics weren't playing tonight, he was going to bring us two of those beers to do on the podcast, but that would have been good timing. Unfortunately, yeah. it didn't work out, but... No, Indiana has some good beers. Uh, my brother and dad are more of the beer connoisseurs, but um, yeah, good, some good things in Indiana, I should say. Well, as you guys know, every episode we put two beers head to head. Big surprise tonight, we've got two more IPAs, uh, the first of which is a local offering. Double Dry Hopped A Street India Pale Ale from Trillium Brewing in uh, Boston and Canton, Massachusetts. So we're going to crack these guys open and get yeah, started. Awesome. Trillium is great. Very, very good. And um, I will preface this. I won't give away what beer number two is, but this will be the first night in a while, I think, that we haven't had any Treehouse on the show. It's true. And it's the first time Trillium gets to go against something other than Treehouse. (laughs) Which is hardly a fair fight. All right. Double dry hop day street. Cheers. Let's do it. Cheers. Lindsay, cheers. cheers. Thanks for joining us. Nancy, oh, Josh. Oh, yeah, we gotta ask. Cheers, cheers, cheers. There cheers. It is. All around. We can beer. all reach each other now. I know. Wow. This is bringing us closer, I think. It really is. I tell you what, I've had the uh, the non double dry hop variation of A Street, and it wasn't my favorite as far as trillions go. It was certainly like kind of down the ladder, but double dry hopping is a technique that works wonders. Yeah. This is really, really good. This is excellent. We forgot to ask Nancy. Nancy, what are you drinking? Mm. Well, <laughs> let me explain. Oh, tonight I have a Frost Beer Works double IPA, thanks to the Duff Master Doofy Frank Duffy in the house. <laughs> um, it's pretty good. 
from Heinsberg, Vermont. Yep, Vermont. Another fantastic yeah. Vermont beer. That's why it's so good. You know? Everything I've had from everything I've had Frost. I don't know, but he, Frank, as a message to you, if you leave your beers here in the refrigerator, they will eventually get consumed. So <laughs> the, it's like forty-eight hour rule, right? It's a forty-eight hours. If you don't pick them up in forty-eight hours, they're fair game. So that's Julie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Lori, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and uh, what led you to be the strength coach that you are today? Yeah. Um, I am a former professional soccer player, played um, in all three of our pro leagues here in the U.S., and a former U.S. national team player, which is the team that plays in the World Cup and Olympics, and um, I really got into training my around my freshman year in high school in Indiana um, because, yeah, Indiana is not really considered a soccer hotbed, so uh, when I would compete against... Um, different states like Jersey, California, um, I realized that I needed to do something else to elevate my game, and so I found strength training, or performance training, whatever you want to call it, and I fell in love with the process, just fell in love with everything, and um, and really that was like my one, like, controllable or go-to, because um, obviously we all know in sports there's not much you can control, and so just fell in love with it. Um, as I got out of college, I would seek out... Um, the best coaches that I thought um, that I'd be reading and seek out to write my program. So Eric Cressy was one of them. Mike Robertson was another. Um, Dave Tenney, who's the fitness coach for the Seattle Sounders. So I just fell in love with process, and um, it kind of eventually led to me to wanting to do this um, post my playing career. And um, so that's kind of a short overview, and, and here we are today. And so I coach um, female soccer players mostly and um, love training and helping out um, athletes who, who want to get better. Yeah, we got some awesome. kind of full circle the past two episodes. We've had back-to-back -back episodes with uh, BSP Nova slash Strength Faction coaches yep. and yep. Uh, you know another member of the CSP family. Your jersey's still hanging up in our gym. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, I yep. see it every day. They're actually yep. the first jersey on the wall when I walk into the, into the gym every day, so that's pretty cool. Part yep. of our family, you've been uh, keeping watch over us on all our staff lists you know, every day since I've been there. Yeah, I was at the, when I first met Eric, it was at your, I don't, I don't think it was the very first facility, but it was definitely the one prior to the one you guys are in now, um, that was more just like rectangle shape, uh, but yeah, it's been awesome. Very cool, awesome. So, um, we got a whole bunch of questions for you, but we're going to kick it off with, um, so it seems that, you know, like intense strength training or, you know, strength training the correct way has become more popularized for women, it might finally be, be becoming acceptable. Um, but if you could make one change in how fitness is perceived by the female population, like what would that change be? Yeah, I would, I would um, like to see the extremes, I would say, change. I feel like we're on one side where we have like weight loss and, um, you know, long distance running, or we have like CrossFit, kill yourself, and, and I'm not saying bad about either of those, right, like, because inherently they're not, either of them are bad, and I'm fine with them, but um, I feel like it could be a little bit more mainstream, you can get results and don't have to be on these two extremes, especially as, like, a former athlete, I feel like that's kind of the two camps that um, retired athletes fall into, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would like to tone down like, kind of both of those, so. Yeah, I think it's yeah. been awesome to see really intelligent and, and intense strength training make it into the mainstream media as acceptable for females. I think you know, what Ben Bruno is doing um, with yep. a lot of his clients, uh, particularly Kate Upton, you know, like what they were doing, uh, you know, made national headlines. I think it's really cool to see what they're doing and, and it's going to open a lot of eyes. I think within our kind of circle of coaches and the clients that we train, Female athletes train hard. It's it's like not a big deal, but to the greater masses, it's still kind of a almost like an outsider thing. So for that to happen was was pretty awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that's a good point. It's like in our circle, and like we all read each other's information or we know each other. It seems mainstream and has seemed mainstream to a lot of us, but till still into the more of like a global aspect, it definitely isn't. I think we're starting to make some headway, which is awesome. Um, I might be misinformed on this, but 
you know, you, you speak as like a, a former athlete. Well, I'm going to make a claim here, and you can just call me out and say that I'm completely wrong. But in my, from what I've seen, um, as a former female athlete, how come we don't see more like female athletic stars be positioned as like role models for for health and fitness? So you see plenty of like training videos of like different you know male athletes, or they might be even like sponsored by like Muscle Milk or other big more like fitness companies, but it seems like every women's fitness thing is just like a fitness model or some person that you don't know. Um, how come you don't see the athletes positioning themselves as like fitness ambassadors? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I mean, I don't know if I really know the answer to that, but I, I do think that um, we're, you know, we're just now starting to see um, females in fitness in general, really, besides, like, two-pound weights and um, lifting tons of reps, and um, so I think we'll start to, I think that'll start to become a little bit more, um, some of the athletes that are retiring will start to take shape into that, in that realm, um, you know, some of the athletes that came before me that played on the national team, like Mia Hamm, all of those players, they were somewhat in that when they were playing, and then it's almost like afterwards, so it's like, okay, I'm ready to settle down and start a family, um, so a lot of them get out of the limelight in terms of like athletic stuff. Um, so, but I think as, as time goes on, you'll start to see, you'll start to see that, you know, especially as um, endorsements start to take shape. I mean, everybody like, that plays on our national team has an endorsement, whether it's through Nike. I think you'll see those continue on um, post playing days as well. It'll just take a little bit of time. There's definitely that like double edged sword with social media, the way that it's spread. Um, you know, intense fitness for females you know, in a positive way, but then there's also the negative side where a lot of the, the influencers and, and thought leaders in that realm are really just like chicks on Instagram with big butts who aren't really yeah. like, they're, they're not providing really no. a, anything, they're not providing anything of value <laughs> when there, there are so many smart, talented, strong female coaches out there. And we're hoping that there's some sort of paradigm shift soon where they can take the limelight and help spread the word so more female athletes can train in an intelligent way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think social, we can all agree that social media is like the best thing and the worst thing, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. What got me fired up was that the video of that, uh, that women's basketball star throwing that t-shirt at a, at a basketball game. What, what was her name? Kelsey Plum, Plum, I think it is. Yeah. yeah, she got absolute cannon. We need, we yeah. need more stuff like that. More stuff. Like that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, because like even, even like powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, like you started to see more female athletes emerge in that, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there was like the ones that were getting the most traction were the ones that were wearing like the least amount of clothes, and they, you know, and like it sucks when it goes in that direction. Um, so yeah, it's like started off as the solution, and now you know. Do you, like, do you, Laurie or Nance, do you believe that that could become, like, part of the problem? Where, so, I think, you know, one of the goals was to try to make something, like, heavier lifting or more, you know, old school training more accessible to females. And then, now you have, like, the people carrying the torch are almost making it probably less accessible again because it's like, oh, well, I don't look like that or I don't want to show up to a gym where it's a bunch of half-naked women doing squats and deadlifts and stuff like that, you know, so that's an interesting predicament. I mean, I guess it's a, it's, it happens for men, but maybe it's just been around so long for men that it's easier to ignore it. Uh, it definitely goes both ways. I think that's why places like Planet Fitness are, like, still in business, <laughs> yeah. because, yeah. like, there are, there are people who are just very, very intimidated, and they think that they there needs to be some sort of, like, barrier for entry to be able to train hard when, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth. Anybody can train hard. Uh, that's why it's hard to walk that, that line and, and be inviting, yet have a stimulating training environment at the same time. Yeah, I think it goes to, like, that spectrum that Lori was talking about. Like, for women, like, it's either, oh, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to be bulky. Or I actually want to be so lean or be toned as, like, one of those options. And they don't understand all these options in the middle. And in magazines, it's promoted as, like, lean, less, like things that take away from a woman. And then on this side, they're like, well, if I lift weights, I'm going to become like this manly man, not attractive. And I think it's just like, girls just, one, they don't have experience really lifting, and they're nervous, and they're scared. And 
they don't know any guys right now that are currently like lifting in the like lifting in the weight area, so they're afraid to approach them and ask for help. It's like really hard for women, I think, to like break down their guard and reach out and ask someone for help because it's just it's it's tough. It's something they don't know, and we know that people won't do things that they're not good at, you know. So I think that's that's a huge huge barrier to entry. Yeah, both of you ladies are are assessing and coaching female athletes, especially young female athletes. What's maybe one thing that each of you does on, on day one to help kind of break the ice and make a, a young female athlete more comfortable in BSP Nova or CSP? Uh, for me, um, I've, got a, I've got a little bit of a, um, a head start because a lot of the athletes that will come in um, play soccer, right? So then they understand that I know soccer so I can speak the language. So that kind of helps out in that regard. Um, but yeah, just um, I just try to get to know them in terms of outside any sort of like sport, what they're interested in. All of those kids are um, watching Netflix and on Snapchat and stuff. So just make jokes like that and then get them at ease. But I find that most of, which is awesome, I, th I really hope that this continues on and to educate the, the young athletes, but they're eager to get in there, right? They're eager to add something to their sport, to their athleticism, to help them carry on. So. Um, you know, it's not that I have to encourage them to like, oh, please stay at the gym. Most of them are pretty eager to get going, right? So just about, about getting to know them. What about you, Nance? Um, I would say I just show them success the first day. Like, awesome. mo most of them don't know how to squat. I'm like, all right, listen, this is how exactly you squat. Put a, like a you know, dumbbell in their hands. And they're like, wow, is that easy? Yeah, it's that easy. And like most like young like, children in general have the correct motor patterns to do it. They know how to hit pinch, they know how to squat, push pull. It's just like you kind of layering it in a way and each rep, each set, you just make them more successful and they're like, all right, I can get the hang of this. And like for softball, it's like the first time you go at bat or even like T work, usually they hit the T first, they knock the ball off and it just takes repetitions, you know, and just give them little little cues, little hints. And once they get it, they got it. And I think some of like the hardest workers at CSP are some of the female softball players and it's because like they understand the movements and they're confident with it and they've seen like continuous growth with it so first day success I think is huge yeah I think that's huge with anyone but that that's such a good point yeah, that, yeah. male or female male or female yep yeah. yeah absolutely yeah I think putting them at ease and making them feel better about the situation like mentally which is kind of what you were talking about Lori and then Physically, like actually, you know, giving them some tools day one so they feel like they're fitting. Yeah. yeah, I think that goes across the board, whether it be male or female. Mm -hmm. um, the same things apply. But I definitely have noticed a trend, at least with our athletes, and maybe, you know, you two can speak to this, but um, the female athletes kick way more ass than the male athletes. Oh. As far as, like, uh, <laughs> they, I can, if someone's like, give me like five success stories, I start to think about a lot of our female athletes before the, the male athletes. Like yeah. they're just way easier to think, all right, yeah, you know, her, 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 and her have come from not knowing a single thing about what they're doing to having huge amounts of success in a pretty short time. Um, they seem to be just more consistent, more focused. Is that a trend that, you know, having worked with more female athletes that you guys see as well? I, I definitely would say so. I'd say like girls are girls want to kick ass, and as soon as you show them that they can be successful at it, they they want more, for sure. Like they and they trust you. Like I always forget that when people come to see us at CSP, like they're looking at us as like we're professionals, and they trust us, and they're gonna trust what you say. So seeing a girl who like reverse lunges like you know fifty pounds. And then, um, like, we have that soccer player who's reverse lunging, like, 95 pounds. Like, that there is insane. I've got, like, I rarely see guys go and touch, you know, weights at that that level, for especially for dumbbells. But girls will, they'll literally work their tail off if you tell them to do it, and as long as, like, they're seeing results in those constant reminders. So. I think a lot of, a lot of the female athletes, too, come in, um, 
you kind of touch on this, Nancy, with like a clean slate, right? Yeah. They they haven't been watching YouTube videos on how to lift weights. They haven't, like, yeah. So they are complete novices, right? And they're eager to learn. Whereas I think sometimes you get with the the male athletes, you get them. They've had some sort of experience, whether it's their dad taking them to the gym or what, you know. So they expect something. They have some sort of expectations where the female athlete comes in and, as you said, it's shown success the first day, then it's like good to go, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. A little bit of a different starting like, point. Uh, I call it like power parameters. So, like, when the four minute mile was like broken, then like so many other people, like runners, were like breaking the four minute mile. I think that's the same thing with lifting. Like, I think the, the leaderboard is a good example. When they look up there and they see all these women who have deadlifted like 330, 315, 325. Whatever, and I, they like, oh, how old is she? Like, oh, like 16. They're like, whoa, like 16? <laughs> like, they're looking 330? Like, I can definitely do that then, you know? So I think as um, female athletes, like, it's, like the more you continue to, like, grow with them and the, the, the stronger that they get, I think it just kind of breeds success underneath of them because they don't feel so limited to, to, to where they can go versus like in a magazine if they see a girl doing a, a 30 minute workout they're like oh I can only be like this big and only lift five pound weights like this is my limit versus going to people who who understand then it's like a whole different realm and they can go in very different directions so if I'm a if I'm a let's, let's go out of the athletic context just a little but like if I'm a, a woman and I want to get into I want to find success right away. Maybe I, maybe I don't have a coach uh, in my area that I can find. Like, where do I turn? Where do I begin to get good information so that I can have success day one and feel like I know what I'm doing? Are there some, some female lifters or coaches or, or role models for you guys that are putting out good inf information and messages? I mean, aside from you two, I mean, obviously anyone listening can start, start with yeah. Lori and start with Nancy. But I'd say it's tough. I mean, honestly, like, a lot of the information I have received is from male coaches. And I think that a lot of the, the, the way that you train females can be pretty similar to the way that you train guys. I think it's just how you just take the information and apply it. I don't think that there's too many, um, like, female coaches out there who have really, like, set the stage, really. Um, but one girl that I really do... Like, love yourself is, like, Sue Felsom. So the Dodgers athletic trainer, I think she puts out really, really great content. Um, it is a little bit uh, more extreme, the level. But I, I really like the stuff that she puts out. But other than that, like, all your, like, Greg and Tony stuff is great. It's, it's super simple. It's They don't use complex language. So I think finding a coach that, you know, works with you and works with your learning style, the way that you can understand it, and if you're having success, like, keep working with it, but. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, I agree with Nancy, I mean, it's like, it's, that's the one thing that we have a challenge with in soccer, too, right, is, like, keeping the athletes, the female athletes involved in coaching, um, because it's tough, and not, not everybody wants to continue on, um, and, and then, Sticking with the soccer side of stuff, we have a lot of females that have continued on, but they're more like sport specific or position specific, and it's more skill based. So in terms of like the performance side, there's not a ton. Uh, but I totally agree with Sue Falcon. She's awesome. Um, listen, I like I'm a big fan fan of like Andrea um, Huddy and with University of Kansas yep. men's basketball. Uh, but some of these coaches aren't. They're doing awesome things, but they might not be putting out content, right? So it's kind of hard, it's hard to find them. Um, you know, like I'm, I've been always a big fan of Girls Gone Strong. Does that message totally resonate with me? No, um, not entirely. But I think what they're doing is awesome, and I think some of the women, um, you know, I think Jen Sinclair's putting out like the Bigness Project and relaunching that. I mean, I think there's some things that you can take away for women that's giving a different um, message than um, like. You know how to become less, right? Instead of like, how do I become strong? So it's bits and pieces, but I think the industry is still extremely wide open. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so I know you mentioned when we were we were chatting before we started about kind of like a new project you have, which sounds like it will be yeah. uh, 
a good source of information for for females and uh, and women out there. So, do you want to talk a little bit about about what you have going on with that? Yeah. So I know you guys had um, Todd Bumgarner Bumgarner on a couple weeks ago, and um, you know he's kind of like overseas and started Shrink Faction. And so uh, me and another female coach, Amanda Wheeler, she's at uh, Mark Fisher Fitness, oh, yeah. um, a good friend of mine. Um, the two of us are mentors within that program. And, you know, one thing that I've always been passionate about since I retired, and even before I retired, because I was like, what is my life going to look like post-playing? How am I going to kind of remain athletic? And what's my training going to look like? Um, one thing that I've been passionate about is, like, you know, educating female athletes on, like, again, how do we, like, kind of streamline or, like, figure out, like, not having these two extremes of, like, long-distance runners or CrossFit, how can you, like, still do the same types of lifts that you did when you were playing, um, you know, feel athletic, and how do we get that out to the mainstream, right? And because I see a lot of my former teammates who, who struggle with that. So, um, you know, Amanda Wheel, Wheeler and I, Wheels, we, we got together and we were talking about how, again, Girls Gone Strong, awesome resource, right? But does it totally resonate? Because I don't wear pink. Not that that's the total message, but I wear, like, high black socks and cut off shirts and I'm a big lesbian. So um, it's a little bit like that. I don't know if that message totally resonates. So we got together and um, we were just like, how can we put out information and, like, bring training back to its roots, which is, like, a lifelong um, pursuit of athleticism. And so here comes formation strength. So um, we just launched it today, yesterday, actually. And, um, yeah, so I'm super excited about it. It's just about uh, putting out great information for former female athletes who, again, want to pursue lifelong athleticism and it doesn't have to be these two extremes. So, awesome. Lori, where can people find more information about Formation Strength? Yeah, formationstrength.com. Then we're on all the social media. Um, on Insta's Formation Strength, um, we actually have a Facebook, a private Facebook group, and we also have a public page. Um, so yeah, Twitter, everything's Formation Strength. So definitely give it a look. Cool. Awesome. And we'll put that all in the show notes so uh, our listeners yeah. can hear. But that sounds awesome. Uh, there's there's something about like um, being a part of a team, like especially in collegiate strength and conditioning, and watching all the athletes, and and everyone's got kind of their their trends and the certain way that they dress and the certain way that they talk and kind of what you described with like the high black Nike socks and the cut off <laughs> like it definitely describes like collegiate soccer and professional soccer right yeah. so I think it's awesome that you're you're preserving some of that uh, with what you're doing with formation strength yeah no like I had mentioned before too it was just um, you know training was like that was like my love, right? And like it got me through and I, that's what allowed me to have the career that I had. And I want to keep continue that on. I mean, obviously I don't want to be doing the exact same training and killing myself like I did a lot of the time when I was playing, but um, taking bits and pieces of that so I can continue to, you know, have that sense of identity as an athlete and like set myself up for a strong life going forward that entails like awesome training and half the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, we're about at the halfway mark, so it's time for beer number two. Beer number and then, uh, two. And then on. Yes. Our, we, well, the great thing about our new location here in the kitchen <laughs> is that we can keep our beer in the fridge now. Uh, we don't have to bring a cooler upstairs. What beer are you drinking? Uh, Nance is good. Yo, I'm so good. I'm just going to top this off here. <laughs> The really tricky part is going to be when Greg has to pee, he's going to have to climb past So the far, I'm doing good. I I kept the pre-podcast beers to a minimum tonight, knowing that I might not be able to pee. We've got this window, though. It's got a screen in it. I don't know how much your neighbors would like that. Maybe we should open it for some air. Should we? Oh, yeah, ventilation. Something else we didn't have upstairs. <laughs> don't hurt yourself. Great service. Wow. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Tip your waiter, guys. All right, so oh, yes. our next offering here is unique, to say the least. Um, it's going to come along with a beer fact. Usually we do our beer fact in the beginning, but we're going to do our beer fact midway. This is the uh, Panna Cotta with Rose Milkshake IPA. Ooh. All right, so this is a, an unusual style. 
you're probably wondering what on God's earth is a milkshake IPA. So I am going to give you uh, just a small tidbit here from the oh, beer fast. Yeah. Uh, this comes from punchdrink.com. And to quote, it's not just, oh, and hopefully I will pronounce epitome correctly if it comes up in this week's beer fest. But there's some big words in here. There are some big words. I didn't pre-read it. I, I skimmed it. We're in trouble. It's not just some clever name. These are hoppy beers, usually IPAs, with lactose sugar added to them in order to help produce a thick, milky, sweet, and often fruity beer that, well, somewhat resembles a classic milkshake. If there's a Thomas Edison when it comes to this new style, it would be Jean Broilette, the fourth owner and brewmaster at Tire Hands Brewing Company, which is where this comes from, um, who Broilette teamed with inventive Swedish brewery Omnipolo to produce something they called the Milkshake IPA. Uh, the 7% ABV beer is brewed with oats, lactose, sugar to create an initial heft, then wheat flour and 50 pounds of... In this case, they're talking about a different uh, flavor, but pectin-rich green apple puree. Uh, pectin causes intense, almost gel-like thickening with beer, an effect most brewers try to avoid, actually, lest they accidentally make a can of jam. But post-fermentation, the brewers also added strawberries, another high pectin fruit, followed by vanilla beans and dry hopping of mosaic and citra, two particularly fruity varietals <laughs> that Broilette jokes are staples easy button of hops due to their ease of enjoyment. So it's definitely a different style of IPA uh, and it comes with a very wow. unique taste. I don't know if everyone can see on here, but this is like, you, you couldn't see through this. Like if you're, if you're like swimming through beautiful golden like mud, <laughs> if you beautiful. open your eyes, and, like, if you die and go to heaven, <laughs> This is what they serve. Hey, you know what? Like uh, everyone who listens know that knows that we go to Treehouse every week, at least once a week, usually tw twice a week at this time. Yeah. Um, and you you stand in line and you walk into the brewery, and this is what it smells like. You walk through the doors of, of a really good brewery, and this is the the aroma that you have throughout the entire. They're brewing panna cotta with rose milkshake IPAs for themselves and not giving it to us. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take a sip. So that is insane. That's different. It's really good. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of flavor. And like, no shit, they're adding a ton of other stuff to this beer. You know, this is not your traditional just like malts, hops, water, the basics. There, there are a lot of, you know, tricks thrown in, but it sure makes for something really, really tasty and interesting. <laughs> Go for it, Josh. You've earned it, buddy. Yeah, I'm just going to have a little sip sip. <laughs> really nice color to the can. There's something from my childhood that's coming wow. up here, and I'm trying to I'm trying to put my finger on it. It's got my vote. Okay, so you know when you have, like, there's, like, those ice cream popsicle-looking things where it's, like, white ice cream on the outside with, like, nuts, like, bits, on, and then it's, like, strawberry oh, yeah, on the yeah. inside? Yeah, I wish I knew what that was. It's like school lunch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy it for like a dollar, like after after lunch at the at the snack bar in the cafeteria. That's what this tastes like. If anybody can come up with the name of what those ice cream bars are called, like let us know because that's that's what we're drinking here. They don't they don't have Ireland. How did you know? How did you know? No way. All right. Brunch. 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 So. To, to get back onto the topics here, um, one thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, um, you know, in your, when you're talking about doing the formation strength thing, you know, we, and, and what we've mentioned all night is that, like, a lot of women's fitness right now has to do with weight loss and body image. Um, and body image is a particularly interesting topic, um, and I think it's, it's a huge problem for men and women. It gets talked about a lot for women and it's kind of swept under the rug for men but lots of women and men deal with body image issues and like body mid, body image you know dysmorphia and things like that um and as someone that's gone through that you know myself as as a male athlete i can see it come up really quickly when i talk to our male athletes uh, but i have a hard time seeing it with with female athletes but i know that it's you know a huge problem driven probably largely by the media and things like that. 
where do you start that conversation with female athletes and like what kind of things can you look for because I do think it's important to to craft a message to to female athletes and women in general um, about having a positive body image you know no matter what I mean, you. <laughs> you go, Laura, you go. Heavy topic. Woo! Heavy topic. Woo! <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say this. I think um, why Nancy and I are in good positions is because I think females need female coaches, right? And they need people to look up to. And Nancy and I are both, um, you know, strong female athletes, um, kind of former now, me. But, um, and so I think the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we... Um, put information out um, via our websites or social media. I think that sets the stage right away, right? And then when you get in and you are explaining to your athletes, like, okay, about injury prevention, about performance enhancement, that sets the tone, right, of, like, um, helping them understand why they're doing this. And, and then just having the, the conversation of, like, healthy eating and, um, you know, strong, I mean, I'm not going to say strong is the new sexy to like athletes, but just having that conversation about why they're doing certain things, what this looks like, um, you want to be strong, you need to be strong. Um, and I think most of them know that, right? Even though that they're getting a different message via social media. So just constantly reiterating that and also living that ourselves is, um, is a step forward, right? Does that make sense? Hope that does. Yeah. Um, so I don't know necessarily know if I go off and start to having that conversation right away, but living that by example, and then as the training process continues, um, you know, and things come up, talking about why we're doing certain things or what's coming up for them, right? So is it accurate to say? I mean, one of the examples, obviously, they have a role model, which is huge, and then kind of combating it without really talking about it, just combating it right off the bat with just with education kind of and just, you know, giving them better better knowledge than the one that they have construed for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, if I'm, I'm looking at, like, this is why I got into this industry, right? One, because obviously I love it, and as I mentioned earlier, but also, like, looking back at my, my career and growing up, I had those awesome female athletes like the Mia Hams, um, Julie Fowdy's, all these players that played on the U.S. Women's National Team to look up to um, when I was growing up. But in terms of, like, fitness, I mean, I was one of two females in our high school strength and conditioning class, right, led by our high school football coach. And so for me, the driving force for what I do is to be the, the role model and – someone to help these young female athletes streamline that process, give them um, the education needed and have somebody that they can like look up to and also, um, you know, strive for, right? I mean, because something, obviously the other female in my high school strength and conditioning um, class was this um, female named Amber Campbell and she's been a two-time Olympian as well. So they're obviously doing something right in this <laughs> um, football um, strength and conditioning class. But at the same time, I mean, there's two, right? Two females that were participating, no females to look up to in terms of that. And so I want to be that for this generation and, and help them along. And so I think um, that alone by education is in somebody that they can relate to is huge. I'm going to hit the pause button real quick. Josh, can you look up what panna cotta is? I think it's, just, it's a dessert. <laughs> it's a dessert? I'm going to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like, like a... a... Yeah, man. Maybe you know. Do you like what's? Do you know what panna cotta is? Because I guess I stopped myself. It's like but is it not like kind of like? It's cheese. Oh yeah, it's like it is. Log, but it's something like that texture. Is it's, it not? It's so, like a, it's like Italian flan. <laughs> there, okay. there is like a kind of like a. It's it's an Italian dessert. Of sweetened cream thickened with gelatin. I'm sure what it looks like, Tony. You might have something. I feel like uh, there's probably like mascarpone on it. Oh, it looks like cheesecake. Yeah. yeah. Cheesecake. Can I, yeah, I feel like I'm drinking like strawberry cheesecake. <laughs> yeah. Well, and another interesting thing is 
for those of us like myself who don't handle lactose that well, <laughs> me neither, really. Have, <laughs> if, you, if you have too many of these, that's it. That's called brunch. I told you. All right, he was well, right. The Irish man was right. All right, Irish Josh, you know, was right for the first time in 11 episodes. Congratulations. Congratulations. So the, the, the treat is called brunch. Which doesn't make any sense to me. Brunch involves bacon, and there's no bacon in that ice cream oh treat my whatsoever. But it's called brunch. It's okay. called brunch. I'll show you. I'll show you. Brunch. 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 But yeah, that, that's brunch. exactly what I was talking about. That's it. That's it. Can you, can you show the people at home? I'll we'll show you guys. Oh my god. This oh, is careful. Getting exposed. There's no way they're gonna see that. Yeah. Anyway, look up, just look up brunch. Obviously, you're on your phone or your computer watching this, so you have access to the internet. <laughs> Um, as I was saying, hugely important, if you <laughs> drink too many of these beers, you will be farting your brains out for the foreseeable future. And you know what's funny is, like, I've, I've had one of these Tired Hands beers with the, the lactose in it. I had the Hazy Jane 2. Um, it was the last beer of the night, um, I think on a Saturday night after a long uh, family feud binge. And I didn't care for it too much. Like it, it, there was, it was definitely just like an IPA with that extra like milkiness to it. And I think something like this, you, you have to go big with the the sweet flavors with the dessert kind of flavors. Like if there are dessert wines. I consider this a dessert beer. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get some of that. <laughs> You're in well, DC. How far is it to Philly? Uh, Two hours. Hop, skip, and a jump. Oh. You gotta go. That's it. Milkshake IPAs. Okay, that's I'm it. And my, uh, my brother's in Boston. Well, he used to be in Southie, but now he's in North Andover. So I've been to Trillium. That's how I know Trillium. Ooh. He's in there. We always make stops. So. It's the real deal. Oh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Trillium is great. Next time you have to go to Treehouse. Treehouse. What? Well, you're froze. Face is frozen. All right, well, while Lori's face is frozen, uh, Nance, do you have anything on the, the body image side of things? Like, have you run into to girl, female athletes um, that have some of, you know, some body image type yeah. stuff going on? Can as well? Yeah. Well, we can hear you. Oh, gosh. All right, you're back. There she is. <laughs> um, I think a lot of women are very, very good at disguising it. And I always take back to um, the difference between, like, self-confidence and self-efficacy. So... Self-confidence is something more like external. It's, it's someone's perception of them being able to complete a task versus self-efficacy is one's own perception of themselves. So if someone can have very high self-confidence but have low self-efficacy, which is a lot of times you'll see like in like star athletes. They'll be like the best girl like on this team, but when they go home, their self-efficacy is very low. So you have like this high, low, like distraction happening. So when you see them in the gym, they're probably per, like perceiving themselves as like, oh, I can do this, blah blah blah, because it's a task. Um, but I think, I mean, I have encountered it here and there, and you can tell really when you can kind of uh, peel back the layers. Um, most people will be like to kind of this is like my way of like kind of uh, weeding it out is like uh, you ask them like what they're doing later. Most of the time they'll be like by themselves, and um, a lot of their focus is on themselves. They want to, like, make their body image better. That's one of their very first goals. It's not um, trying to complete a task or something when they're with you. Um, it's it's very hard to detect with females unless it's to an extreme. I mean, I've, like, I've been through college, and I've seen a lot of girls who, who they're not on, like, either end of the spectrum. Like, they're kind of in the middle, where it's kind of like just like this whirlwind where they'll do it here and there, mm -hmm. um, kind of to like please other people to fit in certain groups. So, I think it's really hard to detect, um, but you'll kind of, you'll, you'll get the hint. They'll do like the same things over and over again. Like, they'll want to eat by themselves, they'll want to like hang out by themselves. And I think like the best thing to do with like with people like that is like to get them involved and show that. Like, they are loved no matter what. And to do activities together that just promote, like, just happiness. Like, you want people to be happy. Like, I feel like a lot of people who have, like, those, like, disorders or anything like that, they just feel alone. That's, like, a big thing. They just feel alone, and they feel like no one is there really to help them. So even if 
you can be that one friend that like steps outside the box and like asks them a serious question. I think like they'll appreciate it. You know, just like someone being real with them because they always have to be fake to other people. So just getting out of your comfort zone as a coach and I think like asking, mm -hmm. I think a lot of uh, athletes will open up and that from there you can like take the right steps little bit by little bit to help. Cool. And that comes full circle to, Laurie, what you were saying earlier, like the first thing you do with your athletes is break the ice, so to speak, and, and just get to know them. Um, you know, as coaches, so much, of what, so much of what we do, obviously it's important that we educate ourselves and that we dictate a good training program, but so much of what we do is, is more on the psychological level and just building really great relationships with our athletes. Um, because, yeah, one of the most rewarding parts of what we do is how – how we can affect all the people yeah. that we work with, um, and and you can you can find out a lot, and people are willing to tell you a lot if you build trust, which mm -hmm. which can take time, but um, if you slowly can build trust and, and work with them, yeah. you know, I I, yeah. I think what we do is really cool, where like we're in we're in such a non um, what's the word I'm looking for. It's a non-combative environment. You know, it's not like a, a team that you have to try out for that you might get cut from or that you might not make. Like, we're in a unique position. We're not people's parents. We're not their coaches. Like, we're on, they know, in, in a lot of ways, they know we're on their side from day one. So if we do a good job of giving them the chance to open up as strength and conditioning coaches, especially in, like, the private sector, uh, we, can, we can learn a lot about the, the athletes that we work with and, and have a really big impact on their lives, which is cool. Sometimes they're like jarringly open with us. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> Sometimes they tell us things I really yeah. care not to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I always say that we're, yes, while we, strength and conditioning is like the service that we provide, we're in the business of like connection, relationships, love, because really that's what people want, right? That's what they're looking for is that connection. And the more you can provide, then great things lead from there, right? So. Yeah, Todd talked a lot about that when we had him on about the community that the strength faction has built and yeah. some of the, the, the proudest moments that I've had as a coach have been, um, in the CSP women's powerlifting group. And then with all the female lifters that we have in the strength house online is the relationships that they built with each other and the support that they give each other and telling each other, like how proud they are of each other, of how strong they've gotten, or just commenting on like, you know, your back looks fucking strong or like your shoulders <laughs> get so big and strong, like stuff like that. Um, watching the interactions there is stepping back and seeing it from a more broader view. Uh, you, you feel like you've done something right when you build a, a team and camaraderie like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, can, uh, I completely agree. Cause I mean, with formation strength, that's kind of like the whole, the whole idea, right? Because yes, remaining athletic, like I was talking about is, is the goal and, having that sense of identity, but really, when you step away from sport, you miss the team, right? No one talks about, like, oh, yeah, those practices were awesome. No, everyone talks about the locker room. Everyone talks about the road trips with your team, and that's what people miss, right? And so it's building it's building those teams, those, um, those communities that are the most powerful. Awesome. Cool. we got a, a decent question to uh, that can bridge off of that. Um, you, know, you, you played for a very high-level team in the athletic realm, but I think all of us and everyone listening, we work within teams in some capacity. Um, so you've gone from uh, you know, being part of a, a high-level athletic team to now working with a team of fellow coaches. Um, what, are, what is like the difference maker that you learned uh, in soccer that translates to working with a team in like the professional world? Did I lose you guys? You guys there? Yep, we're here. Did you hear us? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hello? Oh no. Can you hear us? Hello? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear us? All right, I'm back. All right, you're back. Cool. Yeah, so you guys are all frozen this time, and then I was like, hello. <laughs> um, no, great question. I think um, the main thing is patience, right? Um, is just, I, 
think a lot of times now, and we can go on and on about it, but with like social media, everybody, we want like instant gratification, right? And it's really the long game. And as every, as much as everyone wants to like hate that, it really is. And so, I mean, that's something that like Todd and I've talked about with like, um, with strength action, for instance, is like just, um, you know, putting in the work every single day, whatever that is, the one thing that you can get done. And that's exactly what it was like with sport, right? It's just putting in the work and, um, every single day and then having the patience to, um, have it to come to fruition. Nice. like that. Let me, let me extend that to you guys. All of us, while, you know, while Lori might be the second best athlete here after myself, um, <laughs> uh, we'll see after softball. Yeah. <laughs> We've all we all played sports on some level. Um, what Nancy? What's what's the biggest thing you took from from playing sports um, that that helps you working with a team today? I would say, um, like the probably just like. Um, the like, even though it sounds like so cheesy, but like the buddy buddy system, like finding someone like similar to your size where you can challenge each other and you have like the same goals. I think competition a lot like pushes a lot of females. Like I know definitely at CSP, like both like the Sophias, mm-hmm. like they play against each other on different teams, but they're both like the same size almost, and they kind of like go head to head. So I think one of the biggest things I took away was competition. Um, and the drive just to be, be like the best person I could possibly be, whether that was like in the gym or in class, however it could be, but the, just the challenge, I think. And I think challenging your teammates, I think makes you a better teammate. It puts you on another level where you never expected that you would be for sure. So that's, that's what I would say. Who on our team at CSP is your size? Well, literally no one. <laughs> However, I think that, uh, like, PJJ, I think that's, True. like, a really good example. Like, even though I'm a lot smaller than a lot of the guys. Plus, like, you called us out and we all failed. I, yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's literally it. But, like, no matter what your size is, I think that, like, if you just had that competitive, like, oomph in you, like, yeah. your limit is, like, endless. Like, I don't really back down from a fight because, like, someone's bigger than me. Like, I know that I'm going to try as hard as I possibly can to, like, submit you, no matter what your size is. So, like, that's why I love, like, BJJ, because there's no one my size. I know I'm that's at an advantage, <laughs> but I think that I win a lot of fights because I have, like, more heart and more drive than a lot of people. That's it. Yeah. Like, and when it comes... All- yeah. Are all of you guys doing BJJ now? I am not. I'm not. I'm a lover, not I a fighter. I haven't gone in a month. <laughs> yeah, Greg hasn't back. been in a while. I fell off. I'm gonna. I'm working myself back into it. Yeah. You know? All right. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, but Nance, I will. I will say, hand of God, Nance did almost choke me out once. <laughs> but his girth was so but... <laughs> wide, I could not get my arms around him. I was right there. So heavy, I was like, oh, he's almost gonna die. I definitely got him. Eleven episodes in, you guys, you guys are familiar with the heavy breathing. (laughs) The heavy heavy breathing. (laughs) But uh, little announced to me, I've been training for the BJJ world for a long time, but with my quest to remove my neck completely from my body, (laughs) so it's very hard to choke me out. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, but like training, training with people who are stronger with you, stronger than you. I think it's just a great motivation, especially, like, because, just because I train with these guys, like, I'm definitely stronger than, like, over half the women my size, just because, like, they are just insane, and Greg sits there and yells at himself all day, and it's hilarious, <laughs> and it just gets me amped, and it's it's just a great, great environment, so I think that's yeah. what a team provides, too, is, like, that always, like, that goofy person, you know? You're calling me the goofy person? Yeah, I, 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 you're, you're like, come on, Greg! <laughs> Couple of different personalities. We do, we yeah. do, but we match. We all match. <laughs> How about for you, Tony? Um, Your illustrious, both of our illustrious baseball career. <laughs> yeah, for all my St. Michael's College alums listening, um, I think it's not taking anything personally. When when you're part of a team, if one person is not on the same page, it hurts everyone. 
And one of the, the biggest things that I think gets in the way when you're part of a sports team, when you're part of a staff for a, for a business, whatever, is you can't be afraid to let people know when they could be performing better. Mm-hmm. And the person who's receiving the criticism can't take it personally. And, and this is like uh, something that I need more than anybody because I, I take everything personally and, and I try really, really hard. Yeah, you know that. We've recently you, learned that. I yeah, think you just more than troll ever. on so me incessantly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> stickers are upside down. <laughs> God damn it. Um, but like, if you if you take if you always take criticism personally, you're never gonna grow as a person. And if if people are always taking if, if people are afraid to give each other criticism on a team, you're not gonna grow. If people who receive criticism always take it personally, they're just gonna fall by the wayside. So you can't be afraid to uh, let each other know when they when you could be better, so you can actually get better. And not you know it's yeah. not it's not an attack on you as a person. It's, hey, you're my teammate. I want you to get better so the whole team can get better. And that's a lesson that I'm still learning to this day. Uh, but that holds true for athletics or business or anywhere in between. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a lesson that – that's a lesson that's almost – it's almost easier to do in athletic context. Like, I know when I played baseball, like, I never – I never felt apprehensive to being like, hey, like, you know, you, you need to – keep your fastball down or you need to do a better, do a better job of uh, like backing up your positions. Like it was just part of the game. Like you're doing a shitty job. It's much harder in the professional world to be like that actually um, is what I've found. Um, you know, as an athlete, I felt like I never had a problem doing that. And in the professional world, it takes, it takes a little bit more, like a little bit more self confrontation to be like, I really don't want to get into this with this person, but I probably should. So I don't want to do it. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, you guys kind of touched upon it, but I think my biggest thing from a team standpoint is just like super open just commu- and communication in general um, and always making sure that the lines of communication are open. And so you already kind of said that with your last one. So I guess my next one would be, I think a, one thing that sports does a good job of um, that sometimes gets convoluted in the professional world is like having some kind of hierarchy um, that people don't feel bad about and they don't feel like, oh, so-and-so is the captain of our team or this or that. It's just the way it works. And there's a cer- certain level of seniority and there's a certain level of, you know, people that are captains and you listen to those people and you learn from those people based on their seniority and how long they've been doing the same thing that you're trying to do well now. And in the professional world, you get all kinds of different, like, different personalities and egos and that gets lost a little bit. And maybe I'm old school, but between playing sports and some a small amount of time in the military, I, I value the, the hierarchy part a lot. And I don't think it's, where some people think it's detrimental, I think it's hugely useful in defining roles uh, for people. I mean, if you have a game plan in athletics, you know what your role is. Um, I can't speak to soccer. I've really never, <laughs> was never built for the soccer field, really. But, you know, as a baseball player, um, we had you know, certain roles that we were supposed to fill. They're really well defined in baseball because you play a certain position, you hit a certain place in an order. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but I feel like in every sport, you have a role and you have a game plan and you go out and it's just like head coach of the Patriots always says, like, do your job. If everyone does their job and you know what your job is, you guys are collectively going to get a lot done. So mm-hmm. having some kind of hierarchy and knowing what your role is, two things from sports that I think translate really well to the professional world as well. I agree. Boom. All right. Boom. You guys have anything, last last words you'd like to say? Because I'm out fresh out of questions. <laughs> based on our, uh, well, we got a really good uh, email question, I know, that okay. strikes yeah. more on like the, the hard side of training that I think uh, Lori could have a really good answer to. Josh, hit us with it. So, soccer is a sport where you can gain a lot of match fitness simply by playing the sport. Do you still encourage players to perform a significant amount of aerobic training off the field? Do I encourage them to? Is yeah. That you're, like, yeah. do you? Yeah. Do you program with them? Uh, yeah. So with a lot of listen, like the cycle world is a little bonkers these days, and so these 
athletes are playing like multiple games on the weekends, multiple practices during the week. So with the younger athletes, no. In fact, we try to tame a lot of stuff down, especially with during the season. It'll just be more geared towards, depending on what age they are, geared towards um, lifting and getting them in and out um, and not just like continuously taxing their bodies. But a higher level, yeah, absolutely. I think it just depends on um, where they are in their off season, essentially. Maybe where they are in their season, because a lot of times they're in season, they'll have some sort of fitness coach. But um, I mean, I really think that conditioning, energy systems development, whatever you want to call it, that's really what makes it specific, right? Your programming. Everyone's going to be lifting. Everyone's going to be doing kind of the sort of the same lifts. It's just more of what the demands are. So are they asking for specific stuff towards aerobic? Like what to do? Or No, no. They... Just just if you would like program extra aerobic training, even though they get it in their match, match as anyway. Yeah, for sure, especially if there's an off-season, right? Yeah. And, like, you would start off with a little bit more general and then get specific and more intense as the gear towards what the, the demand of the sport is yeah. as you go. Well, I have a completely off-topic question. Did you ever get to meet Nomar Garcia Para? Went uh, to their wedding. <laughs> oh, That's wow. amazing. Boom! So, yeah. Big Red Sox fans <laughs> here, of course. Uh, I'll never forget. I, I, I cried the day that I found out Nomar got traded. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like, I remember I was, I was in the car with my dad. We were actually in Canada. I played summer baseball in Canada as a kid. And uh, I remember listening on an XM radio. Nomar got traded, and there, there were tears running down my face because he was such a big part of my childhood. But um, that's amazing. You, get, you got yeah. to go to their wedding. Yeah, because um, me and I were teammates professionally and then a little bit on the national team before she retired. Um, both awesome as you would know like Mia was a childhood like I was like fangirl for her and then to be like roommates and teammates with her was awesome but yeah unbelievable probably the, still to this day the, the best wedding the nicest wedding I've ever been to <laughs> it was on um the cliff of Santa Barbara and you had to his number was five obviously and Mia's is nine so we had to have these like little like pens that had the five and the nine on them to even get into the the wedding and I was like yeah, I'm so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I wore number nine yeah, in college, awesome, so. Awesome people. Yeah. And, uh, well, there you go. <laughs> we could have gone to the wedding. Do you still have, do you still have the pins? Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah. I do have the pins. Okay, cool. Yeah, for the amount of times that I've moved and um, been all over the place, I've, I have the pins. I feel like I even I was a Mia Ham fan, and I don't even, like... It's, no offense, it's I didn't even watch a lot of soccer. It's the shirt off and the knee slide. <laughs> like, that's yeah. where I was at. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, you guys, women's soccer is awesome. I mean, I'm a little biased. But honestly, we, <laughs> with Brandy Chastain, like, ripping off her shirt after the 99 World Cup and having, like, the six-pack and the muscles, I mean, people are setting the stage for, like, strong, strong-ass women, athleticism. And, like, I am so fortunate because though, like, Again, like Brady Chastain, Mia Hamm, all of them were all about like athleticism, promoting that, right? And like just being like freaking kick ass pioneers for our sport and just women's sports in general. So yes. I've been fortunate. That's a Sports Illustrated cover I definitely remember as a kid. That yep. like that hit home with me. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, actually, I got that all the cover. <laughs> Of all the women's sports, I would say I watch soccer. I've watched soccer the most, and maybe UConn women's basketball, just because they dominate. Oh yeah, but like, <laughs> like the 90, 95 team. Yeah, cool. All right, well, um, Lori, real quick, where where I know you mentioned it a little bit, but just to recap, where can everyone find out more about everything that you're doing? Yeah, so I mentioned Formation Strength uh, across the board, social media, um, and the website formationstrength.com. Um, I'll be living there in terms of like kind of like lifelong athletes. And then um, personally, Lori Lindsay Six, um, all social media. Um, and then laurielindsay.us is my website, which is geared uh, primarily towards um, athlete soccer development, soccer performance. So, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you again so much for coming on, taking taking the time out of your busy schedule, I'm sure. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, no, this is awesome, guys. Thanks for having me on. Big fans of all of you, so thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Um, yeah. If you want to hang on, we got to do our beer ratings. Sometimes it's interesting. You can watch me on un a uh, unsuccessfully crash cans over my head. Well, uh, <laughs> but but guys, here's here's the situation. We move locations, and none of the beer cans are. Down They're here. right upstairs. I forgot to grab them. It's like this me, is it? Yeah. yeah. That's your job. She's got. To stay. You know the worst part about Iris' job is he acts like we inconvenience him. <laughs> when... <laughs> Well, the thing is, he's, he's, he's got a couple, of, he's got to drop a couple LBs to make his weight class for his He does, life. and he's not, yeah. he just... It's not going to kill him to walk up and down the stairs. He needs to walk. He let the cat out, so you're probably going to see our cat. Um, if you haven't already seen the dog. This is rare. That's like, at first I was like, that's not oh, a cat. there she is. Wow, <laughs> here she is. Hi, of course. Moose. Front, front and center. <laughs> Three pens. Oh, I should drop. Three pounds. Three we pounds. have a chihuahua named Bear, and we have a very small, this undersized right? cat named Moose. Yeah. Three uh, pounds is like an afternoon trip to the restroom, man. It's fun. Yeah, go see Josh. Like, you're mad heavy. <laughs> All right, so we got to do our beer right. rankings. Oh, here. beer ranking. Da -da 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 -da. I like that. All right, let me get by you. While you do yours, I'm going to pee. All right. As is customary. Of course. Yep. My shorts are stuck on the chair. Enough of how beer is telling you. Josh doesn't have my beer well, ratings, so these are going to be completely arbitrary. I have a I think yours was idea. the same as before. Is this Lori yeah. Lindsay pushing a flower? Yeah, I just went on her website. Oh, she's a <laughs> badass. Okay, so I believe Julius was first. Green was second. If you if you have them, can you read them off to me? I don't. You don't, don't have them. them. All right, perfect. Well, sucks to suck. <laughs> sucks to suck. <laughs> uh, well, this is where I become completely lost. I know that C34 shook it up last week. I feel like that was number I think three. you were green. Yeah, and that was too, though. Yeah. Then I have King Sue from Toppling Goliath. Hello, Sue. Hetty Topper. Hetty Topper. Uh, the, the Streets. The Streets, Hayes. which is being uh, subbed for Hayes. Stone Street. Hayes from Treehouse. You have doppelganger in it? Yeah, doppelganger. doppelganger. It's way down here. Wait, no, it was actually this way. Switch those. So. Doppelganger in front of Hayes? Yeah. This is why we need to have a great assist episode so I can uh, switch it up. In perpetuity? Uh, no, cutting tiles, switch. See, that's where it, yeah, see. Thank Sunshine? goodness. No, that, this is old then. Um, Not really. Yeah. No, that's right then, yeah, yeah. No, no I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Oh, I, this is, these are my ratings. I can do whatever I want. All right, so I'm going to put... In perpetuity, in front of cutting tiles, and then swish number ten. I tell you what, man. If if I have swish as my number ten beer, we've been drinking some damn good beers. Tell you what. Um, <laughs> tell you what. <laughs> tell you what. So um, I'm gonna tell you right now that A Street won't make it in the top ten, even though it was very very good. There's no chance. On it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a thing here, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna shake it up. I'm gonna come here. I'm gonna get rid of. The Citra cutting tiles. I'm gonna move Swish to number nine, and then I'm gonna put the Panna Cotta with rose the milkshake. The brunch flavor number ten. The brunch flavor dessert beer dessert cracks the top ten. Dessert beer. Yep. Greg, I'm sorry. And uh, I, if Citra cutting what? tiles gets voted off for you, you're gonna crack it on your head. Yep, I learned some tips though, so it's gonna go better than last time. Yes, All right, yes, concuss. All right, my top ten. Oh, what was that? All right. Uh, fill me in, Josh. Actually, I don't have a photo. You don't have a photo. All right, Moose, you gotta go. Uh, number one, I believe, is Hayes. Number two is Doppelganger. The Dop. I'm going to just re-rate all my beers if you don't have a photo. All right, go. Number three is going to be C34. Number four is going to be green. Green. Let's see what else we You still haven't do this that far, then. Where is the beer all from tonight? Or oh, uh, no, this is over the yeah. course of the show. All oh, oh, from tonight. <laughs> yeah, we're 22 beers deep at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until oh, the, gra the yeah, greatest hit yeah, episode. Yeah, I know. That would be... Then it would be, I would be the best athlete Where on this show. Where's the notion? <laughs> you can actually take that because I, I, I mean I'm a good athlete, but I'm no, no, like, no, I'm a terrible athlete, but I'm a great beer athlete. I'm no That's face. The one that I have. That's um, so good. Uh, number five. <laughs> number five is gonna be 
For me, it's going to be Swish. Number six is going to be The Streets. Number seven is going to be Julius. Number eight is going to be King Sue. King Sue? Number nine is going to be In Perpetuity. Perpetuity. And number ten is going to be Citra Cutting Tiles. The milkshake didn't make it. Milkshake did not make it. Petty Topper didn't make it. So none of tonight's made it? What? Can you take a picture of that? Yeah. Because I can't remember. Hey, Greg, are you okay? The milkshake, milkshake didn't, didn't make, make it. it I like it, but it's not making it's my top so ten. Your taste Those are two sucks. outstanding beers sitting Your on the sidelines. <laughs> Nancy, you haven't. You, you didn't know even a take the here. milkshake. Oh, that's that's what what All right, Lord, before this gets this. violent, we're going to sign off. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Lori Lindsay, for being on here. Make Woo! sure you check yeah. out Formation Strength and all the other things that she has to offer. And we will see you guys again next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Thanks Woo! a lot. Thanks, guys.